Leaves from a Russian Diary. Pitterim Sorokin. Part 5. Thirty Years After. Chapter 27. The Russian Revolution as a Gigantic Success and a Colossal Failure. Some thirty years elapsed after these notes were jotted down. A quarter of a century or so passed after they were published. In the interim, the revolution has come of age. It has turned out to be a gigantic success and a colossal failure. The revolution as a gigantic success. The revolution's first success has been its survival amid very difficult conditions and in spite of many powerful enemies. It triumphed over its internal enemies in the civil war. It withstood the first combined invasion of the Anglo-American French Expeditionary Forces in 1918. It coped successfully with subsequent military pressure of foreign powers. It did not suffocate in the noose of the cordon sanitaire and did not die of the economic starvation worked for by its enemies. It withstood the terrific onslaught of the Hitlerite and European legions and ground them into the dust. Finally, it still faces, fearless, grim, quiet, and more powerful than ever before, all the forces marshaled against it by the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, the Atlantic Pact, and the Vatican, not to mention a host of smaller groups, alliances, bands, and persons seeking its defeat. Its second gigantic success has been its total, unlimited character. The Russian Revolution is not merely political or economic or religious. It is a political and economic and religious and familistic and educational and scientific and artistic and philosophical revolution. It has attempted to revolutionize all basic social institutions from the family to business and the state, all compartments of culture from science and philosophy to religion, poetry, and music, and the whole mentality and overt conduct of an individual from his cradle to his grave. In this sense it is possibly the most unlimited revolution in the history of mankind. Its third success is its unprecedented quantitative scope and worldwide diffusion. If it were limited to Russia alone, its scope would be unparalleled in human history. But in spite of all cordon sanitaires, during some thirty years of its career it has been diffused throughout the entire world. With its Chinese and other allies it has now at least one-fourth of humanity as its followers. In any country, including the most anti-communistic and anti-Soviet, it has a considerable fifth column made up of persons and groups impressive in their energy, fanaticism, and animosity. Even intellectually the bulk of these devotees is, if anything, above the rank and file of the bourgeois population. This unprecedented diffusion has had in the course of these years its ups and downs, but, all in all, it is still growing. Its fourth success is that it has changed even its implacable enemies into its own image. Fighting the revolution, these enemies introduced into their group many traits of the revolution which they are fighting against. Ferociously fighting the revolution's totalitarianism, despotism, limitation of the inalienable rights and freedom of the individual, governmental control of business, nationalization and communization of economics, development of spying, and so on, these anti-Soviet and anti-communist governments and groups have introduced into their countries, under new names and colors, most of these vices and horrors of the revolution. Fortunately, in these countries and organizations, the revolutionary diseases have not developed yet to the same extent as in Soviet Russia. Nevertheless, these anti-communist groups are already infected, and the infection seems to be growing rapidly. The techniques and procedures of the committees like that on un-American activities and of the secret political police begin to have unmistakable resemblance to the techniques of the GPU and the NKVD. Growing limitations of the rights and liberties of the communists, of their fellow travelers, of all the subversives, and of all who are opposed to the policies of the powers that be are simply models of the communist denials of the rights and freedoms of their own opponents. The self-confessions and betrayals of the Budenses, the Chamberses, the Bentleys, and their like are but a replica of the betraying self-confessions of the communist trials and purges. The communist revolution can indeed be proud of thus converting even its implacable enemies. What a triumph! The greatest success the revolution has achieved, however, is its dual role of grave digger and worms of the disintegrating sensate, capitalist, materialistic, secular, acquisitive, socio-cultural order of the West. 
This sensate form of Western culture and society replaced the medieval, ideational and idealistic, forms and has been dominant for the last five centuries. Having produced many a magnificent achievement during the period of its domination, the sensate order has begun to show the unmistakable signs of decay and decreasing creativity. For a detailed development and demonstration of this, cf my social and cultural dynamics, for volumes, and my crisis of our age. The First World War was the first catastrophic shock of this disintegration. The Russian Revolution, a direct child of this war, was the second. After these two shocks a series of further and still more catastrophic ones followed, the anti-communist revolutions of fascism and Nazism, the growing disorganization of capitalist economy, the cancer of demoralized governments, mental, moral, and social anarchy, and, finally, the catastrophic thrombosis of the Second World War, with its subsequent revolutions throughout the world, and preparations for a suicidal Third World War. In these shocks of the sensate West, the Russian Revolution has played the decisive role. Being a monster child of our disintegrating sensate order, the revolution seems to have developed the virus of sensate disorganization in the most virulent form. As such, it has been the main grave digger and the most voracious worm of the socio cultural sensate body of the West, and, eventually, of the revolution itself. It successfully devours the dying sensate order and thus also devours itself. In this way, the revolution clears the ground from the debris of the dying socio-cultural order and paves the way for a new idealistic or integral order of mankind. In all these respects the revolution is indeed a gigantic success, and this success is likely to grow until the dying sensate order is buried and a new creative order is built. The Revolution as a Colossal Failure the destructive success of the revolution is fully countered by its colossal failure as a constructive and creative force. As a creative flop, the revolution has shown itself first of all on the highest levels of creativity in practically all fields of culture, at these highest levels it has not produced any genius of either first or even second class. Even more, it has hardly produced any genius that can rival not only the Russian geniuses of the past but even the creative leaders born and trained under the old regime but still living and working in Soviet Russia. Practically all the banner names the Soviet parades as its great creators are those of persons who were trained and did much of their creative work under the old regime. Present-day Soviet musical leaders, Prokofiev, Mayaskovsky, Glir, Ipolitov Ivanov, Shostakovich, Kakaturian, Krenov, Kabalevsky, all were born, trained, and launched upon their careers under the old regime. The 30-year-old Russian Revolution has not produced a single name that can be put, even by Soviet propaganda, into this class. Musically, on this high level the revolution has been sterile. Through its regimentation of free creative genius it has suppressed and suffocated many a creative musical genius. Others like Rachmaninov, Glazunov, and Gretchenov were forced to flee from Russia. This is true even of musical virtuosos and conductors like Shalyapin, Kusevitsky, Heifetz, Horowitz, Piatigorsky, Elman, Borovsky, and Brailovsky. Not a single new artist of comparable stature has been produced. If anything, the revolution has suppressed the remarkable musical creativity that Russia experienced at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of the 20th century the period of Tchaikovsky, Mussorgsky, Rimsky-Korsakov, Lyadov, Balakarev, Rubinstein, Glazunov, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, and others. What has been said about musical creativity is true of all the other fine arts. In poetry and literature, the revolution has not produced any single name of even remotely great magnitude. Its official poets, Mayakovsky, Essenin, and so on, produced their greatest works before the revolution. Almost all the winners of the Stalin Prize in literature, especially those whose novels and plays amount to anything more than mere propaganda pieces, Sholokhov, Tolstoy, and even Ilya Ehrenberg and Semenov, were all born and did their creative work before the revolution. Even the Soviet star journalists and publicists, such as Ehrenberg, D. Zaslavsky, and E. Tarl, did their chief work before the revolution. In the 1920s they were all either imprisoned by the Soviet government, or put into concentration camps, or else they fled abroad. 
In brief, virtually all Soviet stars in literature and poetry were born and trained and did their creative work before the revolution. It has not been able to produce any eminent literary star of its own. On the contrary, the revolution murdered, imprisoned, or banished several eminent poets and writers such as N. Gumilev, E. Zamyatin, B. Pilniak, B. Zaitsev, Shmolev, I. Bunin, a Nobel Prize winner, Balmont, I. Severianin and others, a still larger number have been muzzled by the government and physically deprived of any creative work, Akhmatova, Pasternak, and so on. As in music, the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century was a period of a remarkable literary renaissance, the period of a Chekhov, M. Gorky, L. Andreev, brilliantly continued up to the Soviet Revolution by their contemporaries and the younger generation of the literati. The revolution smothered this renaissance and ushered in an era of sterility in this field. The same is true of plays, the theater, and opera. Here the standards of the pre-revolutionary opera and ballet at the Mariinsky and Bolshoi theaters and of drama and comedy at the Moscow Art Theater, the Komisarjevsky Theater, and others have been barely maintained and certainly unexcelled. Among the revolution-nurtured plays and operas not a single significant production has emerged. In the field of the cinema a few great films have been produced, but not better than the finest films produced in other countries, and, again, they have been created mostly by persons trained under the old regime, and the government has often hindered the creative activities of some of the artists in this field, like Eisenstein. Still less may the revolution brag about its creativity in the fields of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Apart from hundreds of thousands of mediocre pictures and sculptures representing Lenin, Stalin, Marx and other heroes of the revolution for a short moment, there remain none of the thousands of similar representations of Trotsky, Zinoviev, Mussolini, Hitler, and so on, and thousands of governmentally ordered pictures and sculptures commemorating this or that governmentally approved event. Apart from this sort of painting and sculpture little has been produced by the revolution. If something better was produced, the artists happen to have been trained under the old regime. But even this best falls far below standards of pre-revolutionary creators like Repin, Levitan, Rerich, Vrobel, Kustadif, Petra Vodkin, Serov, and Malayevin. Here again the revolution destroyed the remarkable creative elan of Russian painting characteristic of the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. That nothing even remotely eminent has been achieved in architecture is well attested by the complaints of the Soviet government itself and by its recrimination of Soviet architects for merely imitating the bourgeois styles or the style of pre-revolutionary Russia. Similar confessions on the part of the Soviet leaders of sterility and bourgeois imitativeness in the field of the fine arts are sufficient evidence of the creative failure in question. Still more deplorable has been the influence of the revolution in the fields of religion, philosophy, humanistic and social sciences, ethics, and law. In the field of religious creativity the revolution marked itself at its early stage only by drastic persecution, at its later stage by an attempt to use religions for political purposes. Both policies are very old and have been practiced by many moronic governments. The revolution could not create even an original communist theology, philosophy, or cult, if we call communism, religion. Its revolutionary parades and rituals, demonstrations and mass meetings, are just a variety of old political parade or demonstration, of military ritual or old revolutionary cult. The revolution merely imitated these, instead of creating something new. Some significant religious creativity has been going on in Russia during these 30 years. But it goes on underground, in spite of the revolution and its government. Similar sterility marks Soviet philosophy. For 30 years the revolution has not been able to produce even an original or creative version of dialectical materialism or of Marxist philosophy. What has been produced in the works of Lenin, Bukharin, Deborin, Stalin, not to mention the petty prophets of communism, is a simplified and vulgarized version of earlier, more thoughtful formulations of dialectical materialism or materialistic philosophy in general. All other kinds of philosophy have been persecuted by the Soviet authorities. The revolution could not and did not do anything but suffocate the creative efforts of idealistic and other philosophies deviating from the approved brand of Soviet philosophy. 
In the field of philosophy also Russia achieved remarkable creativeness at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of the 20th century. V. Soloviev, L. Tolstoy and F. Dostoevsky, N. Fedorov, S. Trebetskoy, P. Novgorodzev, V. I. Lapshin, N. Lowsky, A. Videnski, N. Karpinsky, N. Berdiev, S. Frank, S. Bulgakov and many others were bringing Russian philosophy to its maturity. The revolution and its satraps suppressed this movement. Instead, we have now a dull and dogmatic reiteration of a mere shibboleth of Marx-Lenin-Stalin materialistic theology. Since all the social sciences and all the brands of law and ethics except the Marx-Lenin-Stalin theology have been persecuted and prohibited, the revolution naturally could not create anything in these fields. Instead of the brilliant pre-revolutionary development of a science of law and ethics led by possibly the greatest scholar of law in the 20th century, L. Petrajitsky, and by a whole galaxy of eminent scholars in the fields of the general theory of law, the philosophy of law, criminal, civil, international and constitutional law, instead of highly advanced, liberal, and scientifically warranted projects of new codes of law, developed by these eminent scholars, the revolution executed some of them, Lazarevsky, Kohashkin, and others, banished or imprisoned many, drove others into exile or to commit suicide, L. Petrajitsky, for instance, and replaced them with such scholars as Stuchka and Vyshinsky, who have hardly even smelled the real science of law. Instead of highly advanced moral, social, and scientific codes of law, the revolution gave the people the butcher's law codes, more bestial and barbarous than any authentic barbarian code. The responsible judges and courts were replaced by judges and courts whose main purpose was to murder all whom the government disliked for any reason. And they murdered on a mass scale. While in the years 1880-1904 the average number of capital punishments in Russia fluctuated from 9 to 18, capital punishment in Russia was already abolished at the middle of the 18th century for all crimes except one, an attempt against the life of the Tsar or his family. In the years 1918 to 1922 the revolution executed at least 150,000 persons a year. And this does not include all the victims of the civil war. Such was the creativity of Soviet law and justice during the first period of the revolution. Later on, it promulgated the decent-looking constitution of 1936 and decreased the number of crimes punished by death in the Soviet Criminal Code of 1926. In 1947 capital punishment was abolished altogether. But the constitution of 1936 has never been realized even partially, and the elimination of capital punishment means a mere replacement of instantaneous death by a firing squad with a slow and agonizing death in inhuman labor and concentration camps and prisons, where from these unfortunate victims, kept under inhuman conditions by corrective measures, the government squeezes out the last drop of their energy and labor, for the benefit of mankind and a people's democracy, and slowly but surely kills them. Greater cynicism, greater hypocrisy, or greater cruelty in the guise of law and corrective ethics, the world has rarely seen. Only Hitler's concentration camps exceeded this for infamy. Such is the creativity of the revolution in this particular field. The satraps of the revolution seem firmly to believe that the more human corpses are put into the foundation of the communist paradise, the more blood spilled as fertilizer, the more tears and sorrow caused, the faster and the more magnificently will the communist paradise come into being. How far this is from Dostoevsky's challenge, through the voice of Ivan Karamazov. If for the entrance into the kingdom of God one tear of an innocent child is necessary, I shall respectfully return to thee the ticket. Not much needs to be said of other social and humanistic disciplines. Here again, in the philosophy of history, sociology, political science, economics, anthropology, history, and psychology, pre-revolutionary Russia, at the turn of the century, experienced a remarkable creative upsurge. And Danilevsky, predecessor of Spengler and Toynbee in their main conceptual framework, and Michalovsky, P. Kropotkin, P. Lavrov, K. Leontief, and later on a host of first-class scholars, as eminent as any in the world at that period, were not only bringing Russian social and humanistic disciplines to maturity, but fructifying them and vivifying them for the whole world. 
the revolution crushed this movement. Practically all these disciplines were abolished in the universities and colleges. Research and creativity were directly or indirectly prohibited. Many scholars were executed, banished, imprisoned, or subjected to the deadly, corrective measures. The result has been deadly, too. As already mentioned, even in the field of governmentally fostered Marx Lenin Stalin economics, sociology, anthropology, psychology, political science, or history, the dullest bureaucratic sterility has reigned supreme. Later on the Soviet government slightly liberalized conditions because they wanted to have something significant created in order to parade it before the world as the great achievement of Soviet social and humanistic sciences. Alas! Nothing miraculous has come from the muzzled potential creators. In psychology the revolution had to parade my eminent friend, Ivan Pavlov, the great scientist who hated the revolution and did not hide his hatred. When in the last few years the Soviet government wanted to parade the stars of Soviet history and political science it pulled out of the mothballs my former colleague at the University of St. Petersburg, Professor E. Tarl, who wrote all his main works before the revolution, who hated it, and who in the 1920s was arrested and banished to Soviet Turkestan and who only in the last decade was restored to Soviet favor. This means that in all these fields the revolution could not produce even one star of its own and now is forced to star the products of the pre-revolutionary regime. And some of these starred Soviet scholars are often not the first class but the third class scholars of the regime. Professor Durjevin is an example, he was only a petty privat doesn't in philology before the revolution, today the Soviet government bills him as the great Soviet linguist, philologist, and master of other sorts of magic. One need not wonder, therefore, that most of the achievements of Soviet social and humanistic sciences, extolled by the Soviet government as supreme works of Soviet genius, such as the Soviet collective history of diplomacy or the Soviet encyclopedia, are, in fact, mediocre performances, dull, just short of competent, ignorant of many recent achievements outside Soviet Russia, devoid of any true originality, of any sparks of creativity. Somewhat better seems to be the situation in the field of the natural sciences and technology. These have been urgently needed by the Soviet government and therefore have been somewhat fostered, especially in their applied form. Yet even in these fields neither a Soviet nurtured genius nor a particularly important discovery or invention has so far appeared. When the Soviet government wants to put its greatest stars here on exhibition, once more they will almost invariably turn out to be my previous colleagues at the University of St. Petersburg or Moscow or, at any rate, eminent pre-revolutionary physicists, chemists, mathematicians, biologists, engineers, and inventors. Even the famous, or infamous, Dr. Trofim Lysenko was professor of biology before the revolution. An overwhelming majority of the members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in the fields of mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology and engineering are still scientists of the pre-revolutionary vintage. In other cases, not being able to grow them at home, the Soviet government had to kidnap or re-import emigrant scientists like Dr. Kapitsa from England or to hire the services of foreign scientists. These facts prove incontrovertibly that the revolution has failed notably even in this particularly vital field. Murdering, imprisoning, and muzzling the actual and potential creators in these fields, the satraps of the revolution greatly weakened the creative Elon even in this materialistic area. In spite of an enormous increase in scientific research institutions and research personnel fostered by the Soviet government, contemporary Soviet science and technology hardly exhibit so notable a galaxy of scientists and inventors as Russia had before the revolution, Faversky, Konovalov, Chernov, Dokuchev, A. S. Popov, Chibushev, Lyapunov, Furzman, Pryanishnikov, Samilov, Lebedev, Vernadsky, Markov, Pavlov, and so on. Other creators, such as Dr. V. Ipatyev in chemistry, Dr. I. Sikorsky in aviation, and Drive W. Swerikin in television, to mention but a few, had either to flee the country or, fortunately for them, were banished so as to be able to continue their work. During the thirty years of the revolution, its satraps, exploiting all the mental and material resources of the Russian nation, have not been able to compete with bourgeois science and technology. 
In spite of considerable achievements in intra-atomic research, Soviet science lagged in the invention of the atomic bomb. Soviet science discovered nothing so important as the theory of relativity, sulfa drugs, penicillin, new vitamins, and so on. Indeed, most of their gadgets, from automobiles to airplanes and atomic bomb, are but belatedly imitative variations of Western models. To sum up, the revolution can hardly brag about its creativity even in these fields, on these high levels of creativity the revolution has been a fiasco. Unfortunately, it is a colossal failure not only on these highest levels but on much lower, more prosaic and extremely vital levels of creativity, whose improvement is the raison d'etre, the holy of holies, and the only justification for the revolution itself. It aimed and promised to create a new communist or socialist form of society incomparably better than the capitalist or any other form of social organization known to history. Economically, politically, socially, mentally, morally, and even biologically this communist or socialist society of the revolution was to be a sort of paradise on earth. Everyone would serve according to his capacity and would receive according to his needs. Poverty, inequality, exploitation, and injustice would be abolished. A high material standard of living, freedom for everyone to develop fully his personality, freedom from all forms of exploitation and injustice, freedom from tyrannical government, the government as a wise and true servant of the people, freely elected and voted down, the abolition of the death penalty in other, barbaric, forms of punishment, the blossoming of creativity in all its forms, universal happiness and progress. These are some of the wonders of the new society promised by the revolution. After thirty years we find instead a very old and very familiar variety of totalitarian or police state, quite different from the promised utopian society of the revolution. After thirty years of building, paid for by millions of human lives sacrificed, by the untold suffering of still larger numbers, the revolution has built merely a variety of the communist totalitarian type of society prevalent in ancient Egypt, especially in the Ptolemaic period, in ancient China, at the beginning of our era and in the 11th century, in ancient Sparta, Lipera, the Western Roman Empire after 301 AD, in Byzantium, in ancient Mexico and Peru, and then partly represented by the police states, or polisae staten, of the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, to mention but a few predecessors of the Soviet type of society. In all these cases most of the instruments and means of production were nationalized, most of the business was run by the government, and the government overwhelmingly controlled most of the actions, relationships, and life of its subjects. It regarded itself as an elite, by the grace of God or by its own effort, which knows best what is good for the people, without asking them or being elected by them. In brief, the real society created by the revolution happens to be a variety of the type which in the statements of the communist government itself was very old, very despotic, very oppressive, very unjust, and very bad, as the communist leaders characterize all these past totalitarian societies. Some of the naive communist ideologists possibly believe that since they themselves are the all-controlling and all-deciding government, their totalitarian variety is quite different from the past varieties. Such naivete is, however, hardly shared by the majority of the bosses of the revolution, and still less can it be accepted by history, by the people, and by mankind as a whole. Tragically failing in this cardinal point, the revolution failed in all the important properties of society promised or actually built. a. The revolution promised to raise enormously the material standard of living of the people. After thirty years the standard of living of the people is, if anything, still below that of the pre-revolutionary period. The greater part of European Russia still lies in ruins. Reference to the Second World War does not excuse this failure, without the Russian Revolution Nazism and Fascism would hardly have been possible, and without these, there would hardly have been a Second World War. The achievements or failures of any government should be judged according to actual conditions and facts and not according to such an ideal condition as, if we had no opposition, if there were no external enemies, if the people were wise and would enthusiastically follow any decision of ours, if there were an ideal X, Y, and Z, under such conditions any regime and any moronic government would be successful. 
the failure of the Soviet regime to raise the standard of living of the Russian people to at least the level of most of the bourgeois countries or somewhat above the pre-revolutionary standard in Russia is a real failure, inexcusable and undeniable, especially when one considers all the sacrifices and sufferings of the people entailed by this experiment, and all the cruelties, coercions, and butcheries of the Soviet government in its endeavor to improve the standards. Nor should the Soviet government or its apologists talk of the vast industrialization and urbanization of the country and the enormous increase of production. The actual data show that before the revolution the rate of industrial and economic growth of Russia during the period 1890-1914 was as great as the rate during any of the five-year plans of the Soviet regime. If there had been no revolution and no socialization, the economic and industrial status of Russia would certainly have been higher than the present status. In that case the growth would have been achieved peacefully, bloodlessly, without millions of victims, unspeakable suffering, or unbelievable cruelty and bestiality. b. The revolution promised to abolish political autocracy, despotic government, capital punishment and other forms of coercive penalties, and it guaranteed the maximum of freedom of all sorts to the population. Instead it created as despotic a government as is known in the entire course of human history, certainly incomparably more tyrannical than the incapable, impotent, mild, and very human constitutional government of the old regime. The Soviet dictators and the Politburo are not limited by any law, they are above any law, their fancies are the law. They control, from the cradle to the grave, all their subjects in practically all their important actions and relationships, economic, political, occupational, religious, educational, recreational, medical, and biological. They are an omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, through the army of spies, and unmerciful God in relation to their subjects. These have hardly any liberty at all. Their liberty of speech in the press is but to listen to, to say, to write, and to read what the government orders, because there are only governmental papers and magazines, radio and television, books and printing houses. Without government approval one cannot print even his visiting card, one cannot even get paper to write on. If one foolishly says something disapproved by the satraps of the revolution, one finds himself in a prison or concentration camp for criminally inclined individuals in need of grim educational and corrective measures. And these measures range all the way from execution to a milder form of hard labor. The subjects do not have the liberty of choosing either in what part of Russia they would like to live, in what town, in what part of the town, in what room or corner of the room, all this depends on the satraps. The citizens do not have much choice in their occupation, they are assigned to it directly or indirectly. The citizens have largely to eat, to drink, and to wear what is decided by the government. Indirectly, in a number of cases, the government decides whether or not an individual is to marry, and whom and when. To sum up, the Satrapian government of the revolution enjoys unlimited freedom from any limitations imposed upon it by the people, and the people have little, if any, freedom from the government. C. The educational correctives of the satraps of the revolution give another measure of the freedom of the Russian people. During the thirty years of the revolution, its government has executed at least from one million to one and a half million. Of its citizens directly, murdered many more millions indirectly, arrested, imprisoned, or banished them, coercively transferred from one area to another several millions, all in all, not only in absolute numbers but even in the percentage of the total population of Russia. There has hardly ever been in the whole history of Russia a period of thirty years that could rival in this respect the thirty years of the revolution. As already mentioned, before the revolution, in the period 1880-1904, the annual average number of executions fluctuated from 9 to 18. Compare this with the most conservative but apocalyptic figure of 30,000 annual executions during the years 1918 to 1950. Keep in mind that the total population of prisons, penal camps, and all kinds of places of detention and banishment in the pre-revolutionary period amounted to a small fraction of 1% of the total population. In these revolutionary years it fluctuated somewhere roughly between 10 and 15%. In the initial period of the revolution, 1918 to 1922, on an average, 
one of every five grown-up persons was arrested and imprisoned at least once. The whole Soviet paradise is, indeed, one gigantic prison in which the communist, warden, autocratically rules over some 200 million of the inmates. As in any prison, all main resources of this vast house of detention are communized and nationalized, severe discipline is coercively imposed upon the inmates, pitiless hard labor is demanded from them, their remuneration and wages are insignificant, an infraction of any rule of the warden is brutally punished. At the slightest provocation the inmates are executed. This is the picture of the freedom that the government has built after 30 years of labor. One can hardly imagine a more tragic bankruptcy. D. Similarly, the revolution did not abolish exploitation. It only replaced a limited exploitation of the employees by a private employer, of the poor by the rich, with unlimited exploitation of the people by the government and its fellow travelers. Whereas before the revolution a citizen could turn to the courts for redress in case of unlawful exploitation, now there is nobody, except God, to appeal to against exploitation by the government. e. The revolution did not abolish social inequality and social ranks and classes. In terms of the amount of income or fortune or material standard of living the Russian population today makes up a tall economic pyramid, with the large stratum of the poor and with many narrower strata of the well-to-do of various ranks, up to the top millionaires, made up mainly of the highest ranks of the communist officials and their specialists, fellow travelers. In terms of the amount of rights and privileges the population of Russia ranges from the communist gods, the Politburo and other top ranks, who enjoy unlimited rights of life and death in relation to the rest of the population and its possessions, to the Soviet outcasts in the prisons and penal and labor camps, and the outcasts who are out of prisons but may be arrested and deprived of all rights and even life itself at any moment. Pre-revolutionary Russia had some three to four million members of the Tsarist nobility. Present-day Russia has from five to six million of communist nobility. And this new nobility is much more privileged than the old Tsarist nobility. Indeed, it has already become to a large extent a hereditary nobility, with several educational and other privileged institutions open only to its progeny. In hundreds of other forms social inequality and stratified class and semi-caste society have been thriving in Russia during these 30 years of revolutionary equalization. BD possidentes is again a solid reality there. To sum up, whatever creative field one takes, from the highest to the lowest, the creativity of the revolution is zero or very low or even negative. As a creative force the revolution and its satraps are a complete failure. Diffusion of cultural agencies and values as the main constructive work of the revolution. Though not truly creative work, the successful diffusion of literacy, schools, science, technology, medical help, scientific and research institutions, some healthy forms of recreation, and of similar cultural values and agencies has been the main constructive work of the revolution. In this work the revolution has been reasonably successful, so far as it has diffused real values. However, even in this useful work the revolution's tremendous success, so well propagandized by the Soviet agencies, has been notably less significant than it appears if one compares it with what was peacefully done in this respect in pre-revolutionary Russia. As to literacy in schools, through the law passed by the Duma and approved by the Tsar, universal literacy was to be realized in 1919. And the greater part of this project was actually realized in 1916. Thus without any revolution the universal diffusion of literacy would have been accomplished earlier and more fully than by the revolution. The same is true of higher education, research institutions, and social service agencies. They were all developing and spreading very rapidly in pre-revolutionary Russia. As to nationalized medicine and free medical health, so much extolled by the apologists of the revolution, the sober fact is that the free medical service was nationalized in Russia many years before the revolution, that nationalized medicine was the main form of medicine in Tsarist Russia, that this form functioned very well, that qualitatively it was very high and quantitatively was spreading fast before the revolution. In other words, free medical service and nationalized medicine are not an invention of the revolution but existed long before it. 
If there had been no revolution, its actual diffusion would have been at least as great as under the revolution, and qualitatively it probably would have been higher than under the revolution. The same goes for the diffusion of gadget-mindedness, gadget inventiveness, mechanization, and industrialization. As mentioned above, the rate of industrialization and economic development before the revolution was at least as fast as during the most successful five-year plans. As to gadget inventiveness, the number of technological inventions by Russians grew rapidly as we pass from the 18th to the 19th and then to the 20th century. The Soviet government itself inadvertently confirms this by claiming a large number of the most important inventions, radio, electricity, telephone, the steam engine, the guided rocket, the submarine, the tank, and many others, to have been made first by the Russians, before the revolution. It is very probable that if this trend of technological inventions had continued peacefully, without a revolution, Russian inventiveness at the present time would have been greater than it is under the revolution. Another limitation of the successful diffusion of values and agencies by the revolution has been the diffusion of many doubtful values and the multiplication of doubtful agencies, side by side with the real and truly valuable. The diffusion of a monopolistic materialist philosophy, of ethics of hate and violence, of hatred for everything bourgeois or deviating from the approved Soviet patterns, diffusion of many theories and ideologies that are phantasmagoric scientifically, ugly aesthetically, and demoralizing ethically, diffusion of the silly cults of Marx, Lenin, or Stalin, with the incredibly fatuous glorification of these men, especially of Stalin, as the genius of all geniuses, the greatest leader of all. The leaders of humanity, the infallible and superwise, the unconquerable conqueror of all the enemies of mankind, similar to the incantation of many illiterate tribes addressed to their gods, kings, and chiefs, unfortunately the revolution diffused much more of this trash than the genuine values of truth, beauty, and goodness. Finally, its work of diffusion has been greatly vitiated through the direct inhibition, prohibition, and suppression of the diffusion of many real values, from the aesthetic to the religious, that were disapproved by the satraps of the revolution. These facts greatly reduce the magnitude of this constructive work of the revolution, rendering it less significant quantitatively and qualitatively. However, considerable useful work of this sort has been done by the revolution and this work should be noted. The foregoing analysis shows that the revolution has been most successful as a purely destructive force that eliminates the moribund social and cultural values, which would have died without any revolution. It has been moderately successful in diffusing real and pseudo-values. And it has been an abject failure as a creative force. The Reasons for the Revolution's Destructive Success and Creative Failure Since the sensate order of the West and, in connection with it, Eastern culture and social institutions are in the process of disintegration, and since the revolution itself and both world wars are the most important manifestations of this disintegration, the apparent destructive success of the revolution is due entirely to this malady of decaying sensate culture, institutions, and personality. Having been produced by this sickness, the revolution, after its emergence, has become in its turn one of the central foci of infection in the Western and Eastern worlds. It has helped to disintegrate what was already falling apart and would have died eventually if there had been no Russian Revolution. In that case there would be other foci of infection, and other revolts, and revolutions, and more anarchy, performing the task of the Russian Revolution. In fact, a multitude of these, beginning with the fascist and Nazi revolutions and ending with the Chinese, Indonesian, and others, have been doing this very thing. This general state of disintegration explains the incessant earthquakes, social tremors, and eruptions over the whole planet, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, and in the Americas. It explains also why the attempts to stop these earthquakes have failed. It is not because the leaders of the anti-communist or anti-revolutionary movements are more stupid or less skillful than Lenin, Stalin, or communist and revolutionary leaders in China and Indochina, but because the anti-communist and anti-revolutionary leaders are trying to accomplish the impossible, namely, to revive a corpse. In such situations the grave diggers and worms are always more successful, no matter how mediocre, even stupid, they may be.
It is only the frightened imagination of the Lilliputian politicians that views all these eruptions as the result of the diabolical genius of Stalin or the Politburo. They inadvertently magnify, glorify, and idolize the power, the genius, and the supermanliness of the revolutionary leaders. Thus these little men contribute a great deal to the success of the revolution. Decades ago, making a superman out of Lenin, they assured us that nobody could replace him in the revolutionary leadership and that after his death the revolution would either decline or else radically change its course. Lenin died, and nothing happened. The revolution continued its course and its leadership fell upon Stalin, who at that time had hardly ever been mentioned as a possible boss of the revolution. Similar assurances by these little members of the various ex-committees on unex activities or the blatant politicians about the irreplaceability of Stalin are likely to be as wrong as their assurances about Lenin's supergenius. The same is true of their assurances, policies, and expectations in regard to other leaders in China or Greece, in Indochina or India, in the Middle East or the East Indies. Knowing nothing about the basic process of disintegration of sensate culture or viewing such theories as a purely academic yarn of unrealistic, ivory tower, dreamers, these little anti-revolutionary and anti-communist leaders are incapable of fighting the real disease. They fight, instead, a few spots of the red rash covering the social body. No wonder their efforts have been fruitless and the rash and the high temperature have greatly increased during these thirty years. To sum up, the revolution is not an isolated, self-sufficient event of human history, but one of four chief manifestations, along with the Nazi fascist revolutions and the two world wars, of the epoch-making disintegration of our sensate Western culture and society that has dominated mankind for the last five centuries. Since this order is crumbling, the destructive work of the revolution, after its emergence, is easy like the destruction of the two world wars, it is actually but a concentrated form of this general crumbling process. Such is the main reason for the destructive success of the revolution. The reasons for the revolution's creative failure are also at hand. Since the revolution is one of the main manifestations of the death of the sensate order, such agony, by its very nature, cannot be creative. For the same reason both world wars were infinitely more destructive than creative. If any creativity has been displayed by the revolution and the world wars, it was a drop in an ocean of destructivity of these three musketeers of the disintegration. Even this, creative drop, has been largely poisonous, like the atomic bomb and other gadgets of destruction. In a more concrete form this general reason is stated in the last paragraph of The Leaves. The revolution and two wars imply hate and coercion instead of love and freedom, moral cynicism in lieu of the universal and eternal, don't kill, destruction of life in place of its affirmation and promotion. In the leaves these lines were jotted down as a result of a direct experience in, and a close observation of, the First World War and the Revolution. During these thirty years these verities have been tested and retested and found to be roughly valid. See my Sociology of Revolution, Social and Cultural Dynamics, Volume 3, Society, culture, and personality, and the reconstruction of humanity. Hate in various forms and intensities is the prime mover, or the dominant force, of revolutions and wars. Only secondarily are they animated by some modicum of love. But even this love exists only in so far as there is a hated enemy. It is this hatred of the common enemy rather than love that binds temporarily the members of one party or nation into one hand and opposes it to the other party. Not a mutual love but a hatred of Hitler and all he stood for bound into one hand Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt. As soon as this common enemy was disposed of, the previous comrades in arms turned into enemies. Similarly, it is mainly hate against Stalin and communism that binds together the members of various Atlantic and other anti-communist pacts. If and when the common enemy is eliminated, these allies are likely to fight one another. Hate does not have any reverence for the hated. It does not recognize any moral restraints. Sadistically, it revels in torturing and even murdering the hated person. Don't kill, it replaces with, kill. The more the better. It glorifies this wholesale, sadistic butchery. 
It bestows upon it the titles of hero and savior, honors and ranks, medals and prizes. It even blasphemously invokes the name of the merciful God of love for intervention in this hateful business. Still less are hate-animated wars and revolutions willing to grant freedom to the enemy. They revel in intimidation and coercion, physical and psychological, of the hated party and of all who are not of their own faction. Intimidation, terror, compulsion, torture, murder, and blindly furious destruction are the techniques of hate, inherent in its nature. So far as revolution and war are the vastest outbursts of mass hatred, these techniques are also the main operational method of wars and revolutions, inherent in their nature. Being most effective in destruction, these techniques are entirely unfit for creative construction, the nature, the method, and the techniques of genuine creativity are entirely different from, in fact, opposite to, those of hate, of revolution, of war. Creativity is the inspired free activity of a genius. It is the highest and purest form of freedom. Creativity is a work of love of the Creator for the created. Love is again the highest and purest form of freedom, otherwise it would be coercion. Creativity, freedom, and love are thus in part identical. For this reason each member of this trinity requires the other two members. None of the three can be realized or exist without the other two. Hence the absolute indispensability of freedom and love for creativity, of creativity and love for freedom, of freedom and creativity for love. Love freely creates and recreates. Freedom is always lovable and creative. And creativity is always free and loving. Especially is this true of creativity in the field of interpersonal and intergroup relationships. Any creative transformation of these relationships consists in a replacement of hate by love, of strife by solidarity, of war by peace, of separateness by unity. A series of observational and experimental data testifies that this objective can be achieved only through the method of love and freedom, and not through the techniques of hate. Whether in interpersonal or intergroup relationships hate, egoism, and aggressiveness in the attitude of one party generate, in 60-90% to of responses, hate, egoism, and aggressiveness in the other party. Kindness, love, and help in the case of one party engender kindness, love and help in the other, in our experiments in 65-97% to of cases observed. Therefore, in so far as any revolution or any war seeks as its objective a peaceful, harmonious, unified, solidary, and creative society, the method of hate destruction cynicism compulsion can never achieve this goal. The wars and the hate inspired revolutions that have employed this method have invariably failed to be truly creative. In spite of being often conceived by idealists, they all are carried on by murderers and profited from mainly by scoundrels. They have all yielded destruction instead of creativity. For the same reason, all those who at present place their hopes in armed coercion, destruction, and hate, and all those who prepare either new wars or violent revolutions, all are doing the work of destruction rather than that of creative construction. No matter what their names, titles, or authorities, they are neither saviors nor creators but destroyers of the creative spirit of truth, beauty, and goodness. Such, in brief, are the reasons for the creative failure of the revolution and of the two world wars. For all those who are anxious to take part in a genuine reconstruction of humanity, the conclusion is clear. Only in one kind of war or revolution should they participate, in war against the eternal, implacable enemies of mankind, death, disease, hate, misery, insanity, and uncreativity, whenever and wherever they are found. The war against these enemies is the only holy war. It is the war of humanity against the inimical forces that incessantly attack it and the successful discharge of the creative mission of humanity. These enemies are formidable. Any successful campaign against them demands the complete unification of humanity, of all its parties, nations, creeds, races, and classes. It demands a complete elimination of all internecine wars and revolutions. It requires a radical replacement of the contemporary human war of everybody against everybody by a common cause against the inhuman enemies. This is the war and revolution in which our participation is not only permissible but obligatory. 
This means that we must carry on the free work of love for all the fighting factions and for humanity at large. This creative, unselfish work is the key to the reconstruction of the world. Leaves from a Russian Diary Pitterim Sorokin